More than 1,000 Red Ritter veterans are making the transition from the front lines to the classroom. We'll introduce you to this diverse group of students right here on campus. Here's your assignment. Create a high fashion showstopper and a piece of furniture to match. We take a look at the College of Human Sciences apparel design and see what these future designers are doing in the community. But first on Inside Texas Tech with Chancellor Ken Hance, we take you inside the Chancellor's classroom. Of all of the classes across Texas Tech, one of the most popular and hardest to get into is the Chancellor's Leadership class. Good evening, everyone. I'm Robert Giovanetti along with Chancellor Ken Hansen. Chancellor, we're going to take a look inside your classroom a little bit, but it's got to be one of the most rewarding parts of your job, isn't it, every week teaching these well, guys? I love it. It's a one-hour course. It's pass-fail. Uh, if you show up, breathe, and take notes and listen, uh, you should pass. And uh, it's uh, to tell them about some everyday experiences, and we bring in top-notch speakers. Uh, we've had Ed Whitaker, uh, who was CEO and Chairman of the Board of uh, AT&T and General Motors. We've had Paul Foster, who gave Texas Tech $50 million. Uh, we've had Linda Rutherford, who is uh, Head of Communications for uh, Southwest Airlines. So we bring in some great people, and I want those students to know that they're sitting 20 feet away from someone that was just like them, that was a student at one time, and now those people have done extremely extremely well, and, and one of them, in fact, is a billionaire, and I, I want them to dream no little dreams, which is my motto for Texas Tech. Uh, we talk to them about motivation. We talk to them about time management. Uh, you know, if in this world, everybody, you, everyone you compete against, they may have more uh, intelligence or less. They may be faster or slower or whatever. The one place you start even with everyone, there's 24 hours in a day and the person that manages their time the best, they're going to excel. We also talk about uh, communication. Uh, one of the things I do is that uh, when we talk about communication, I will, on the front row, we've got about 12 people. I'll tell the one on the far right end, so I'll whisper to that person, and they've got to whisper to the next person, and at the end, the last person's got to tell the class what I said, and I tell them what I said, and they've never gotten it right. So if you go through 12 change of commands on transferring information, there's going to be some mistakes. The closer you are to the source of the facts, the better your decision-making process. Well, you mentioned communication. That is what you were teaching the day that our cameras were in your class. Let's take a look. Dr. Kenneth Davis, one of my favorite professors, he, he was an English professor, and I just I almost changed my major to English. And, but he was great. He always told us, in communication, it's not important that people understand you. It's got to be so clear and concise, they cannot misunderstand you. That's good. Make it clear and concise that they cannot misunderstand. Most problems that I have with any workers in, in my lifetime is because they did not properly understand. I had a, a person that worked for me in Washington he had a bachelor's, a master's, an MBA, a law degree, and a veterinary degree. He later went to medical school. He liked college. <laughs> he liked it. Should have gone into sales. Anyone who talked their parents into putting them through that many degrees should be in sales. They're effective. <laughs> They're effective salesmen. And but he drafted a letter, some farmers from Freona. They wrote me this letter, and he drafted an answer. And people would draft an answer, I'd look at the answer. And then I'd change it. The answer was three pages long. It used some words that I didn't know what they were. If I sent that letter to the people in Freona, they're going to have somebody drive up and try to get me and bring me back home. They say, something has happened to him. <laughs> something bad has happened. <coughs> and uh, it was about a subject, and I changed the letter. And the letter said, dear, you know, Farmer Brown or whoever it was, I agree with you. Four words. First sentence, can he misunderstand that? And what does he think when the congressman writes him and says, I agree with you? He thinks, this guy's smart. <laughs> he agrees with me. And then you can put uh, another sentence or two, and you're done. You, you put it in the mail. They get it. They're happy. You're happy. And that's it. 
Otherwise, you send a three-page letter, and you might say in that letter that you agree, but it might be so fuzzy that they think, he's trying to come out, you know, he's trying to weasel me around. Make it clear and concise. The shorter, the better. Also in communication, it needs to be interesting if you want people to listen. If I got up here and just read to you out of a book, I'd be putting you to sleep. If you want people to understand what you're saying, you've got to sometimes entertain them to a certain extent. Uh, now, some people don't talk much, but when they say something, it's significant. Calvin Coolidge was president of the United States, and he didn't talk much. And one night at a dinner party at the White House, a lady <coughs> sat next to him, and she said, Mr. President, I've got a hundred dollar bet that I can get you to say more than three words. Because usually he just nod and, you know, he wouldn't say anything. Anyway, she said, I got a hundred dollar bet I can get you to say more than three words. And he looked at her and he said, you lose. That's all he said. <laughs> she didn't get more comments out of him. She lost her hundred dollars. So, but, but did she understand what he was saying? It was to the point, you lose. If you're speaking distinctly, establish eye contact. I had, a, I had a person that I was interviewing for a top position at Texas Tech about three years ago. And he looked at his shoes. I started looking at his shoes. I thought there was something <laughs> wrong with them. What, what, you know, I, was I mean, if somebody come in the office, it looked like a couple of ant, anters, uh, ant eaters looking for ants to eat or something. We were both looking like we'd lost something. <laughs> Is there something wrong with your shoes? Look me in the eye. The eye is the most important communication you get. If, if a person, some guy asks you to go out or go someplace or hang out with them or something, and uh, look at their body language. If they don't look you in the eye or say, you wouldn't want to go to Spanky's, would you? <laughs> you have to look, you know. A trick I learned in Washington, I, I get bored. I don't drink, and I'm not against it or anything. But at cocktail parties, it just I, I always tried to go late. You know, if the cocktail's from 6 to 7, dinner at 7, I tried to get there about 5 or 7. But every once in a while, you'd have to be there early. And I always had a deal that I would look. If somebody is, you know, I was getting pretty bored, I'd look between their eye in their ear. And they'll try to, I had a lady one time at a cocktail, she was all the way over like that trying to line up my eyes. It was fun. And uh, she probably thought I was a little way. But just look between their eye and their ear and they'll try to line up with you. Try that sometime. You know, they're, they're looking. They're looking. The body language is very important. Now, the other thing you want to do is to have a game plan on what you're going to do, what you're going to say. You know, there was the story in the New York Times I read where a, a fella was in the newspaper. He was in Central Park, and he goes up to a guy, and he said, I lost, I lost my job. I lost my family. My, I lost my wife, my children. I lost my house. I lost my cars. I don't have anything but this gun left. Could I borrow some money from you? See, he had a plan. <laughs> it's called robbery. You know, don't do it. He had a plan. It was a, it was a stupid plan. Uh, when my daughter was in the seventh grade, she's an aggressive kid. I don't know where she gets it, but she's, she's mentally tough and aggressive. And she was trying to win a contest on who sold the most magazine in the seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. And they were selling for some charity, it's PTA or something, I don't know what it was for. And she said, she came home, told me about it, and said, I'm going to win. I had no doubt she's going to win. She's focused. I just felt sorry for the kid that's going to be second. And she did win. But one of my neighbors told me about a month later, one of the funniest stories, she went to their door, knocked, they came to the door, she made the pitch to the man. And she said, we're selling magazines. She went through everything. And he said, Susan, 
we've got all the magazines we need, but thank you anyway. And she said, I understand. She said, Karen, that was his daughter. When Karen comes down to our house selling those Girl Scout cookies, we have all the cookies we can eat. <laughs> but we still buy those cookies. And he said, what magazine do you think I ought to buy? <laughs> Well, Chancellor, that was a great look inside your classroom. Did, did the guy buy any magazines? He did. Uh, he he uh, immediately said, uh, which magazine do you want me to buy? <laughs> it's a funny story. My uh, daughter's probably going to kill me for using that story. But I told her, when, you, when you're selling magazines, be focused. How do I accomplish this goal? And that's what I want these students to do. If they've got to go, how do I accomplish this goal? What are the ingredients to success? I want them to just stop and think. We have great students and they're gonna do great things in this world. You know, one of the great things about your class too is when I've been there, how they line up afterwards, after the class to come down and, and talk to you that somebody in their family knew you or there's some kind of connection and you, and you spend a lot of time with the students. Well, I, I've, I've enjoyed it. I had one kid came up one day and he said, my granddad played basketball with you in high school. And I said, son, <laughs> your granddad's not, uh, it, it couldn't be true. Uh, unfortunately it was. Well, and then you have some smaller time with them too because you do small class discussions. Uh, what I do is so that I can get to know them better uh, that we take uh, 10 to 15 students uh, each Wednesday after class for 30 minutes and we have what we call a lab section and we bring people in and let them ask any question they want about setting goals, about what they want to do in life and that gives them a, a little interaction with me and, and allows me to chance to get to know some of them. And, and years ago you taught business law when you were when you were at the law school. Right. And now you're teaching this. Do you ever have anybody that said, hey, you taught my dad or something? Well, I've, I've had several of those and uh, and that's been, uh, that, I always liked that, uh, that I've uh, taught two generations and that I had one of my uh, students uh, when I taught business law is worth probably eight, nine hundred million, maybe a billion dollars and someone said, it wasn't he in your class, and I said uh, yes, and he took notes. <laughs> you know, those other kids didn't take notes, so they'd be billionaires. And uh, so I always have a lot of fun with them, and it's a uh, it's a great opportunity for me to know what's going on, and it's a great opportunity for them uh, to see some of the people like Ed Whitaker and people like that. All right, Chancellor, we'll hear a little bit more from you later in the show. Still to come on Inside Texas Tech, there's something for everyone at the Commons. It's the university's latest and greatest dining complex. We'll bring you the sights and sounds. Plus, making the transition from the battlefield to the classroom, we'll tell you about Texas Tech's military and veterans program next. But first, we leave you with a look at the happenings around the Texas Tech system. We touched on it briefly in September. Now we can say without hesitation that Texas Tech University saw record enrollment numbers for the fourth straight fall semester. More than 32,000 students are on campus for classes. Adding to that number are more than 4,700 first-time students. That's the second most in school history. Undergraduate enrollment set a standard with more than 26,000 students. Texas Tech University Interim President Lawrence Skuvenek says, quote, once again, a record number of students are attending Texas Tech University for their education. As someone who's been here for many years, I'm proud to see our continued growth and enrollment and quality." End quote. Around the system, the Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center also seeing record enrollment. More than 4,300 students enrolled in the fall semester. That's up more than 7% over last year. Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center President Dr. Ted Mitchell says, quote, Our growth in enrollment reflects the university's commitment to providing the communities we serve with these highly skilled individuals. End quote. One for you, Texas Texas Tech Athletics fans, the Board of Regents approving media rights agreements with ESPN and Fox Sports Media Group. It's part of the new media deal for the Big 12 Conference. With the new 13-year deal, television revenues for Texas Tech are predicted to nearly double, growing from roughly $10 million to $20 million per year. And finally, Chancellor Kent Hans entertains a crowd at the United Spirit Arena as the City of Lubbock is once again given the award for being one of the 100 best communities for young people. That's your look around campus. I'm Brandi Blake. Don't go anywhere inside Texas Tech with Chancellor Kent Hans. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Ken Burns, inviting you to watch our latest film, The Dust Bowl, right here on KTTZ-TV Channel 5, part of Texas Tech Public Broadcasting. Did you know there are more than 1,000 veterans currently enrolled at Texas Tech? Our Keith Kohanek recently visited with one of these veterans and takes you inside a tech life in transition from serving in the Marine Corps to navigating life in higher education. Um, what's the size of the 
size of the audience going to be? Am I talking to 15 people or 1,500 people? Todd Truesdell acts like most tech seniors. He goes to class, takes notes, and makes sure to check in on the sign-in sheet. He's also part of a small group of student veterans. Fresh out of high school, Truesdale enlisted in the Marine Corps. It took him across the U.S. and even overseas. The Marine Corps was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. But, you know, there comes a point when you've had enough structure and you want to do something with yourself other than what the Marine Corps is going to tell you you're going to do. So after five years of service, he left the military. To add to his experience, he wanted a college degree. It was a task he wasn't exactly sure how to accomplish. I haven't taken math classes in 10 years. The military doesn't necessarily prepare you enough for the outside world, for college, for you know, registering for classes, and, and basically doing all the legwork leg on your own. So you're left as a little fish in a big pond. That's where Tech's military and veterans program stepped in. MVP works to assist veterans as they transition from military to civilian life. The program encourages community engagement, connects veteran students with resources for success and more. They have people working for the MVP that walk you through the, the entire process. Um, and, and the questions that you don't know to ask, they, they answer for you. When you've been out of the loop and out of the system for so long, it's tough. So a lot of guys don't take advantage of the, the, um, the schooling and the programs that, that were instituted and, and created for them. Well, Chancellor, that was a very interesting story about Todd, and we've got those stories all over. But what people don't recognize, not only Texas Tech, but also Angelo State, we are military friendly. We are. Uh, the last four years, uh, they rate the uh, top 15 percent uh, colleges and universities in the nation on being military friendly. In other words, do we make it easy? for someone that's been in the military uh, to enroll at Texas Tech or Angelo State, and we do. Do we also have courses that uh, will help them during the transition? You know, I mean, if, if you're uh, in Afghanistan with a rifle and people are shooting at you, and then three months later uh, you're going to class, I mean, there's some transition there. And uh, we understand that. We have over 1,300 uh, veterans that are in school at Texas Tech. Uh, Angelo State has almost 500. Uh, we have over 380 uh, faculty and staff uh, that are veterans that have served this country and served with distinction and honor, and we're proud of them. And we're proud of the educational opportunities that we provide for people that have served in the military. Uh, they're a great benefit to us. Uh, I think that it helps those in their classes uh, understand more about what they go through and what they've been through and uh, that they're coming to college to finish their education. And do we see a lot of time those students are actually more serious students than maybe just coming right out of high school? I, I think the, the, the kid, you know, somebody's been shooting at you mm -hmm. with real bullets, uh, you're gonna be real serious uh, about uh, studying for an exam. And so they're a lot more serious. Uh, they have better grades and uh, they work hard, but we wanna make it a smooth uh, transition for them. Uh, we make a counseling available. We try to do anything we can to help them be successful and get their degree at Texas Tech because we appreciate what they've done for this country. And we've seen such a growth here at Texas Tech and at Angelo State since you've been on board. Was it something that was a priority for you when you came over? It, it was and something that we have uh, worked with our staff. Uh, we have some staff members at both schools that help recruit uh, military people. Uh, we uh, send out publications. Uh, in fact, in the, at Angelo State, we have a national security study program and we have over 500 people uh, studying that program, and uh, most of them are studying online, and they're in the military now. And so when they get out of the military, they will have earned some hours with us, and they can transfer those into being a full-time student at Angelo State or at Texas Tech. Just another example of some great things going on here that maybe a lot of people don't know about. Uh, we do some great things at Texas Tech, and it's because we have great staff. Uh, we have people that love Texas Tech, they love what they do, and I'm just proud to be a, a part of it. All right, Chancellor, thank you very much. In many college courses, it's a given that students will spend hours writing papers and reading textbooks, but as our Paul Hunton shows us, one course on campus adds a real-world component to better prepare students for their future career. 
Lubbock is a long way from the designer runways of New York and Paris. But Rachel Anderson, professor at Texas Tech University, is making sure that her students in the College of Human Sciences Apparel Design and Manufacturing are getting a full education in fashion. People don't consider Texas Tech a design school, but there's actually some very good design programs such as the art program, such as the interior design program, apparel design and manufacturing, and theater and costume design. Their most recent exhibition inspired some pretty fascinating design choices and helped students go beyond simple apparel design. My concept of the Warrior Terror exhibit came from the idea that design is design no matter what medium, inspiration is the same. In this case, the students were able to kind of break free from those restraints creatively and create something that is for an art exhibit that doesn't necessarily have to be worn or be functional. For senior Megan Riscow, finding the inspiration wasn't the hard part. It was going outside of her comfort zone and designing furniture as well as clothes. That was a little bit of a challenge for me just because I'm so focused on designing clothes that it really made me go outside of the box to design a chair. Going outside of the box is an understatement for senior Caitlin Moore, whose phone-inspired chair and dress were a way for her to try something new. So I saw the telephone chair and just suddenly was inspired by the telephone cords on the telephone. It's different. It's something I've never heard of before. And and so I wanted to do something different than just making a normal dress or something like that. So I wanted to do something unique and different. Wear Your Chair was exhibited at the Louise Hopkins Underwood Center for the Arts. And for Executive Director Karen Wiley, having a relationship with Texas Tech helps foster education in the arts. To be able to learn how to express yourself in a varied way as these wonderful students did with their designs is just, it's an inspiration to all of us, I believe. So obviously, Robert, I'm not wearing a chair, but I got my 1970s uh, polo vintage jacket out here because I was feeling fashionable after hanging out with those kids. I actually have a couch very similar to your tire that, that <laughs> I think you're having. I thought maybe you've been to my house to get that tire. No, so. no, this is, this is actually vintage. But yeah, one thing that was fascinating about, about that class was the students being able to take their, what they've learned in the textbooks and apply mm -hmm. it to a real world situation. And then not only that, but then getting to exhibit it in a art museum. I thought that was very neat. Yeah, it's good to see how our students are out doing some things that are maybe a little outside the box. Definitely. It's great. Paul, good, good job. Thank you very much. Coming up next, our Marcella Garcia takes us to the hardwood at the USA for an in-depth look at the Red Raider volleyball team and Coach Don Flora. Plus, even the pickiest of eaters can find something at the Commons. All this and more when Inside Texas Tech returns. Let's put our heads together to think. There you have it. That is Don Flora and his Red Raiders are a fresh young group that may be just what the doctor ordered. Coach Flora with 19 months under his belt and bringing in 10 newcomers this season, nine of those freshmen have had a great first half. Our Marcella Garcia hits the court to check out what the Red Raider volleyball team is serving up for the second half. A lot about teaching, a lot about the you know, learning and teaching process. Uh, we really want our players to understand volleyball, the big picture, how to play the game, not just their position, but the why and the how. This was a sleeping giant as a program. It had had some difficult years, and I thought, boy, if that job ever opened up, that's something I'd love to have. Ed, there's this kid that Wait, be disciplined. It's gotten better and better. Um, it was a struggle my first two years here, and then Don came and did a 180, and it's completely different now with him. And so I'm just so thankful that him and JoJit and Beth are our coaches now. I'm just, it's. 100% better. He's very positive. Like he'll tell you, he'll give you constructive criticism if you make a mistake, but he'll always tell you something you did right in the process, so you're not leaving it feeling all negative about yourself. You you know you did something right, so it's a lot easier to improve upon yourself once um, you're being told exactly what you're doing wrong. So that's nice. Well, this year, you know, we're we're growing a, a bunch of new athletes. We have a, a lot of newcomers, and so our goal is to really set the foundation with this group to show how we go about the process of learning, how we go about the day-to-day -day work. 
Uh, and then I think, you know, we want to be a competitive NCAA team. We look to, to be in the NCAAs, and we have an opportunity to do that if we do the right things. We wanted to make an impact within the Big 12 and have teams worry about us and put up a good um, name for our program, start building the program up, and that's what we really wanted to do this year. Well, there's a number of people that have come and they've said, once I've come, I'm coming back. And I would tell people, once you get in the seat and you see what's going on in the court, win, lose, or draw, we're going to fight, kick, and spit. We're going to get after it. It's fun to watch. We're all really enthusiastic, and we, we like to keep people's attention up, so we'll make it interesting. This is Coach Flora's second season with the Red Raiders and after going to the games and talking with the girls at practice, everyone is really enthusiastic and positive about the direction the program's headed. Well, and you can see that he's, he's intense, but he's kind of laid back, but he, this is a guy who knows how to win. Definitely. Um, in 2001, he won a Division III National Championship at Laverne. And, that, and that's out of California. And he's kind of got that California cool about him, doesn't he? He, he does. Total, I can see him say surfs up all the time. <laughs> I can see it. <laughs> well, that was a great look behind the uh, behind the scenes. Thanks for doing that, Marcel. No Tech's latest and greatest eatery has something for even the pickiest eater. Our Sophia Halbrook takes us inside the Commons Dining Complex and shows us not one, but two food courts and tells us what it took to construct this state-of-the-art dining facility. The Commons really was the outgrowth of a um, $3 million endowment that we provided to Tech back in December of uh, 2011, which established two um, scholarship programs, one on the graduate level and one on the undergraduate level. First of all, I'm very excited about this project because uh, after 11, 10 and a half, 11 years of designing food service and um, food service environments, it was really nice to get to do this inside uh, my alma mater at Texas Tech. I, want to, I really like coming here to eat. It's nice. There's a lot of room. It's nice to have the loft area. I mean, there's a lot of really good food, especially like Einstein's bagels. I like the burger place to grill. So, you know, the food's really good, it's pretty cheap, and it's a nice location, too. Um, it's a two-story facility with a mezzanine level. If you haven't been in it, it's pretty, pretty captivating view from the top, looking out across the campus. Um, it has a fully operational food service kitchen, so we don't, here in this operation, it's not shipped food in, heated up. It is actually cut, prepped, prepared, stored, and served on site, which we're very proud of our fresh food environment and fresh food service and um, it also creates just a vibrancy in there where people are cooking and it's just exciting to watch. So much like the Tech campus, it had, I think vibrancy is a perfect word. Uh, students, that, that college life is very vibrant and active and robust. You're actually seeing that uh, from a conceptual perspective in the food service kitchen preparation area. That's all the time we have for tonight. Thanks for joining us and have a great night.